Okay, so let's get started. My name is Marshall Chin, and on behalf of the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics, welcome to our next session on our yearly series on the ethics of healthcare reform. So we're, we're very fortunate today to have uh, a speaker from the outside, Dr. Steven Schroeder, who is the, a distinguished professor of health and healthcare at the University of California at San Francisco. So Dr. Schroeder has a very interesting background. He grew up in El Cerrito, California, which is a working class community on the East Bay in Northern California. Went to Stanford for undergraduate, Harvard Medical School, and then the Boston City Hospital for his residency in internal medicine. Also spent a couple years at the Centers for Disease, Disease Control's Epidemiology Intelligence Service. Uh, he started his career in Washington, D.C. at George Washington University in Academic Journal of Internal Medicine. And he was, uh, just like, as we know from ethics, uh, you know, Dr. Siegler is the father of clinical medical ethics. Uh, Dr. Schroeder was one of a group of about 12 people who were really the fathers of academic general internal medicine, fully founding the field and eventually becoming the president of the Society of General Internal Medicine. He then went to uh, UCSF in San Francisco, and there he built one of the premier divisions of general internal medicine, which to this day remains one of the, the top uh, divisions of general internal medicine, and really was fundamental in, in really creating the, the division as an example of clinical folks who did great clinical care, great research, and great teaching, which again, what was a new concept back there in the 70s. Between 1990 and 2002, uh, Dr. Schroeder was the president of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and had many accomplishments. I'll just point out four that have been lasting. One was, in, you know, was a major initiative in tobacco cessation at the time then that there were the major decreases in smoking within our country. There was also then a, a major role the foundation played in the expansion of childhood health insurance, the CHIPRA program. And so again, fundamental for bringing millions of, of children uh, into the world of health insurance. Uh, he also was the person at the foundation that, that uh, did what we take so much for granted now, but was really one of the first to basically incorporate health as well as health care in the work of, of, of foundations doing work trying to improve population health. And then finally, he made major inroads in a variety of diversity programs designed to increase the diversity of the uh, U.S. healthcare workforce. Dr. Schroeder then went back to uh, San Francisco, and he's been really a major player in the national stage. He's been on uh, numerous important uh, committees, so of note, uh, particularly for this talk, he was for years a member of the U.S. Uh, Prospective Payment Commission, which advises Congress on uh, physician payment issues. He has numerous honors, too. I'll just mention one, that at, at the ripe old age of 43, he was elected to the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine. So that's Dr. Schroeder's CV. I'll just tell you a little bit about Dr. Schroeder, the man. Uh, I've known actually Dr. Schroeder for almost 30 years now, uh, that uh, he's been a, one of my mentors since uh, my first year of, of medical school. And what I can tell you is that um, he's maybe one of the top two or three people I've met in my lifetime in terms of his ability to be a great listener. Uh, just very um, empathetic, sensitive, caring, great instincts in terms of being able to size people up and figure out what they need and how to be responsive. A uh, great bedside manner. He's, he's one of these doctors that can get away with actually sitting on the bed of the patient and talking to them in a very natural way. And I just summarize by saying that he's a man with the, the highest integrity, the highest ideals, someone that has been a great role model for thinking about how you can try to make impact on a wide societal basis while also treating people, individuals, with dignity and respect. Dr. Schroeder? Well, Marshall, thank you. That's hard to live up to, that kind of an of a, of a, of a introduction. I'm very pleased to hear it. It's wonderful. One of the benefits of, going, of getting older in academic medicine is you watch your former students flourish. And uh, Marshall just said, I was a president of SGIM. He is the incoming president of SGIM. So let's give a hand to Marshall. For, uh, and I have a very full day here, here today. I've met some fascinating people. Uh, and I've got a quote when President, Ken and so this is a city of presidents now, right? And I got a quote President Kennedy when he got an honorary doctorate from Yale he said, now I have the best of both, poss both possible worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. So I'm gonna say, now I have the best of all possible worlds, a UCSF faculty position, a Harvard education, and a University of Chicago t-shirt. 
that Mark just gave me. But what I'm going to talk about today um, gets into the ethics of how money gets spent. Um, and as you know uh, from my title, and as you know, actually prior to coming in here, we spend a lot of money on health care, and there's a lot of criticism that we don't get the value from it that we should get. So I'm going to take a quick poll. How many of you here think the United States has the best medical system in the world? OK. So not many of you. Um, I would say I would raise my hand, which might shock some of my left-wing friends, except to say for people like me, it is the best. I'm insured. I'm knowledgeable. I know where to go. Uh, I'm living in San Francisco where the quality is very good. But most people would say no. How many people have, for the younger ones, uh, parents, or for the older ones, spouses, who are happy with their current medical care? Yeah, and I am too. And that's one of the reasons why it's been so hard to get health care reform, because most people are worried they're going to give up something that they really like. For those of you who are active clinically here, how, how many of you are active clinically at UC? Okay. For those, how often do you see instances where medical resources were wasted? Often? Okay. Same thing at UCSF. Finally, do you think that especially income potential has a major role in medical student career choices of what specialty they choose or what kind of an area they choose to practice in? Yeah. OK. So here we go. Um, we spent a lot of money, almost 18% of GDP, almost $3 trillion. The next highest country is either France or maybe the Netherlands, but they're about 12%, so much, much lower. And most of the others are less than maybe even 10%. Um, people talk about why don't folks, you know, what's so, much, so big a barrier to getting covered by health insurance? Well. The annual premium in 2010 for a family was 15K. And there are a lot of people for whom an extra 15K, and that's pre-tax money, is uh, going to be tough. We get poor value for the health dollar. I'm going to show you some data on that. And it's interesting, as I've been watching this, and I've been working on this issue really since the 1970s, you see fads. Every couple of years, there's a new fad, a new, quick, painless way to lower the cost, to lower the amount of money we're spending on health care. And the more recent ones are, let's get an electronic medical record in every place. That'll do it, because we won't, when someone comes to the ER, we won't duplicate x-rays. On the other hand, you'll slow up what a doc does by 10 to 20% and actually lose money. Um, or pay for performance. Or let's judge different technologies based on what their payoff's going to be. All those are reasonable things to do, but by themselves, they don't have a chance in lowering uh, our rate of rise of healthcare spending. And what they really show is that the fundamental drivers of rising healthcare costs are at the guts of our political system. So it's pharmaceutical industry, device and in, in, in insurance industries, hospitals, doctors, unions, and patients. And we don't want to get at those. So this just shows you what's been happening. In 2012, I think the data were about 17.7. Whether it's going to get here or not, I'm going to show a slide later to show that there's been a flattening of spending for health care. Whether that's going to keep going or not, I don't really know. But you can see that it's really come up. And when I was uh, starting work in this field, which stemmed, I'm going to show you, from my observations of waste, we were at a GDP of about 7%. And economists were wringing their hands saying, oh my god, it's going to hit 10%. And it did, and it barreled right through it. So Harvey Feinberg did the Shattuck lecture a couple of years ago. And you can see the US in red. There was a, uh, a laser pointer here at one point, and now it's gone. But uh, I'm not sure that I, that I need it. Um, you can see in red at the top was the US. We were clustered around other places in 1960. And we're not now. Ah, so let me put it there. OK, thank you. And just do, just do that, right. OK. Um, and you can see some of the other countries with which we kind of compare. They're all going up, but we're going up much, much faster. 
And Harvard Business School has noted this. And they talk about the US value, the US healthcare value shortfall. So here we are, life expectancy, one, pros one uh, proxy measure for outcomes, obviously not the only one, healthcare spending. And here we are as this huge outlier, about in the middle to the lower third of the pack of the wealthier countries in terms of how long people can expect to, to live, but out of line in terms of how much we are spending. So I'm gonna now go through an analysis of why we spend so much more than the other countries. And this is personal, but it's a distillation of reading the literature and knowing it pretty well, working in the system, working in ways to try to change it. Others might parse it somewhat, somewhat differently, but I think this is pretty much mainstream. So I'm gonna raise a number of theories. Are we expensive because we have more doctors per population? No, we're actually in the lower half of the European M MD supply. So we, we don't have all that many doctors. But where we stand out is the proportion of our physicians who are specialists are off the chart in comparison to others. Most of the other countries have 40, 50, 60% of their physicians are in, in primary care. Ours is, is much, much less. Is it that people working in healthcare make a lot of money compared to others? Yes. Uh, it's not just uh, high hiring surgeons, it's the nurses, it's the, uh, it's the respiratory therapists, it's everybody. It starts with the CEO. So I just read recently that the CEO of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, which is a very strong one, very good one, very big, makes six million dollars annually. When I started out in healthcare, directors of hospitals were called just that. Now they're called hospital CEOs. So we've monetized and made healthcare into a business and we pay well for it. Um, and we pay a lot more for people up and down the spectrum in hospitals and in healthcare compared to, to other countries. Um, is it that we have more hospitals? No. We actually have fewer hospital beds than most developed countries. Do we stay in the hospital longer? No, we actually discharge them faster. So they leave our hospitals sicker and quicker. But we have a much higher proportion of ICU beds, and I'm gonna come back with a story on that. And we do a lot of costly stuff, whether it's heart surgery, uh, dialysis, oncology care, um, imaging, you name it, we do much, 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 much more of it than other countries. And, and this is why I think Marshall asked me to come today, how we pay doctors is a big reason. Remember that doctors only get about 20% of the healthcare dollar, but they account for another 60% by deciding whether someone's gonna get a medication or whether they're gonna go into the hospital or get something else. So incentives facing doctors are pretty critical. So how did I get interested in how doctors get, get paid? Well, as Marshall mentioned, my first job was as medical director for the George Washington University HMO. And we started pretty small. And um, our specialists were capitated. That is, they got a fixed sum of money for caring for a relatively small number of patients. They felt they could do that. But just to make sure they weren't gonna get the short end, they submitted bills under fee for service and they would calibrate those, and then the next year when we were gonna get what their, uh, what, what their capitation rate was, they could reflect on what, what the ex experience was. I was familiar with billing in general medicine, but not with some of the radiology and the surgical techniques, and I was flabbergasted, because I knew that some of, the, some of the procedures didn't take much time, and yet the amount of income that they were charging was so much more per hour of time than what my colleagues were getting, that it really piqued my, my interest. And then when I went to UCSF five years later, we did some studies to sort of, dupl to sort of demonstrate that. So let me show you this one. This was a study in m medical care that my colleague John Shostak and I did. And what we did is we used the common fee-for-service payment model in the mid-70s in California. We constructed four hypothetical practices of general internists. The first three were solo, and the fourth was a four-person group practice. And we escalated the amount of procedures to be done for new patients and follow-up visits uh, when we went from practice A to practice D. Uh, and we decreased 
the amount of patients that we're going to be seeing by 5% each. So model B saw 5% less than model A, model C saw 5% less than model B, model D saw 5% less than C. And what we did with model A, all the lab tests and EKGs and stuff were farmed out. Somewhere else got the revenue, but the model A practice didn't get, the, uh, get, didn't get all the overhead to have to pay for it. And we costed out what it would take to do EKG, to do chest x-rays, to do chest x-rays, to do stress tests, um, and in the final one to do a multi-channel chemistry test. And you can see that model D, which sees 15% fewer patients than model A, has net revenue, this was in 1975, uh, excuse me, in 76 dollars of three times as much as model A, showing that uh, even in humble general medicine, if you do stuff, technology, lab procedures, it has a much higher profit margin. And that, of course, is still true today. Then we did a study saying, how did this happen? And we traced through the history of usual customary and reasonable charges, how physician panels got started and all that, and we published this in the, in the, in the Blue Shield Journal. So to keep on with this, uh, I'm interested, as having been on uh, in academic medicine much of my life, how the opportunities that I uh, gave you to, a chance to talk about in our poll, how they influence what young doctors do. And have you heard of the road to, to happiness? So this is a big buzzword at, at matching time, that residents know that radiology, ophthalmology, anesthesiology, dermatology, and if you're English, emergency medicine, have are the dream specialties. Why is that? High income, shift work, you're not burdened with caring for people with chronic illnesses, and you can go home early. And so that's the road. Um, I've heard my doctor's sons, I have a son who's a cardiologist and one who's a pediatrician, have heard them and their colleagues talk about specialties and the realities of medical practice, that I've served on some boards of hospitals, and I've watched my sons as they deal with the business aspects of the medicine. And they're both, by the way, extremely happy being doctors, and it was the right kind of career for them. One of the things that hospitals are doing now, they're kind of selectively buying up practices. Cardiology is the best case for this. They're buying up practices of cardiologists, so now probably 75% of cardiologists who used to work independently are working for a hospital. Why are they doing this? Why are the hospitals doing it? There are different rates of paying for cardiac procedures. So if you do an echocardiogram or an EKG or a stress thallium test in your private practice cardiology lab, you'll get 1x payment from Medicare or from private health insurers. If you do it in uh, the same procedure in a lab owned by a hospital, but it could be that same lab, the hospital just bought you out, you'll get three to four X. And so the doctors gain, the hospitals gain, the payers lose, the patients lose. So the National Commission, and I'm gonna have to get that out of here, which I should have done, sorry, to hold up. Uh, National Commission for Doctor Payment Re Reform was uh, an outgrowth of the Society for General Medicine, and here it is. Um, and I'm gonna tell a little bit about how that got started. So the then president was Harry Selker. And Harry, under uh, the Clinton, planning for Clinton healthcare, was very worried about ethical, uh, our, uh, Mark, consequences of um, capitation payment, which are things like what Kaiser has, where you get a bundle of money to take care of patients, and it's assumed that you'll take care of them well, but you have a financial incentive to do less. And, and Harry was really worried that was gonna surface one more time, and he said, I want you to do a commission, I want you, Steve, to chair, as a former president of SGM, and someone who's written about it, to chair a commission which, which lays bare the ethical conflicts inherent in bundling or, or in, in capitation. And my answer was, Harry, there are conflicts of interest in every way that you pay doctors fee-for-service, salary, bundling. I won't take your narrow uh, ambit, but if you, if you will widen the, the viewpoint of what we're gonna do, I will do it. And he said, fine. So our game plan was we just didn't want something that was gonna sit on the shelf. We didn't want a predictable, 
General internists say pay us more, which is kind of predictable. Uh, so we wanted the membership um, to re reflect a broader group than just general internists. We want a document that would be terse and would, uh, would get uh, a, a longer life. Um, we wanted to be independent from the sponsoring group. We didn't want them to have veto power over it. And we wanted to focus both on uh, federal payment, but also on private health insurance. And most of the commissions and groups doing this have mainly focused just on uh, federal programs. So in planning for this, uh, we estimated, now when the Institute of Medicine does something like this, and I've been on several committees and chaired a couple that the IOM has done, they have a bunch of meetings, they have a large staff, they do a review of the data, they bring the membership um, in uh, of the committee three or four times, they work on drafts, it's usually about 1.5 million. We figured we could do it cheaper, we can do it for eight, eight, 800,000. Um, and we then went knocking on doors. And we, we got a very, we got some funding, 195,000 from Robert Johnson Foundation and 25,000 from the California Healthcare Foundation. And that was it. So then we had to figure out, do we cash it in? Do we say we can't do it or should we try? So we tried and we did it as sort of a short track. Uh, we, I had a, a half time staffer. I served on a pro bono basis and probably spent about a quarter of my time during the year doing this. One of the virtues of, of being old is your days aren't as busy as they used to be. And we only had one face-to-face -face meeting. And actually, it was the first one was canceled by uh, Hurricane Sandy. So this, we had to reschedule that one. And we did pay for a consultant to help us with the, with the rollout. So here are the members. Underline means a member of SGIM. Asterisk means uh, that you're a, you're a doctor. So I was the chair. We got Bill Frist to be the honorary chair. Why Bill Frist? Because he's a doctor, knows his stuff, and he swings writer than R-I-G-H-E-E-R than most members of SGIM, most academic general internists are pretty much left of center. And so we wanted the credibility that he would bring in. In fact, that turned out to be a wise choice. Troy Brennan, a physician who's chief medical officer of CVS, on a side note, partly as a, as, as a result of this uh, work, I got to work with Troy to roll out the decision by CVS to not sell cigarettes in pharmacies. And there was an article in JAMA that you might have seen on that. Let's give, let's give CVS a good hand. Yeah. Susan, Suzanne Del Banco, who used to be the head of LeapFrog and is uh, not a lawyer or a doctor, but just whip smart. Tom Gallagher, who's an ethicist that Mark probably knows, who's the University of Washington. Um, Jerry Kennett, who's a cardiologist. So we want to get someone whose ox was, going to get, was probably going to get bored, gored, because um, he, cardiologists, as I mentioned, really benefit from higher prices for procedures. Richard Kravitz, who is a very smart internist at UC Davis and is a co-editor of the Journal of SGIM. Lisa Latz, who's a physician working for a managed care company, WellPoint, health insurance company. Dr. Kavita Patel, who was a former Robert Johnson clinical scholar, was working in the White House at the time of the ACA um, and is now at Brookings. Mernus Rosenthal, who's an economist at the Harvard School of Public Health. Amy Whitcomb Slemmer, who's a lawyer and who's an advocate. And Steve Weinberger, who's the executive vice president of American College of Physicians. So it was weighted towards doctors, but not only doctors, and gave, wasn't an entirely kind of a predictable commission. And here it is, pretty slim, um, nice graphs. Let's see if I can find a couple. About how much specialties make and that sort of thing. And I can actually, I can pass it, I, I can, can pass it around, so. Um, and we also, Dr. Frist and I, I should say Senator Frist and I, I think that's his kind of preferred title now, maybe it's doctor, um, had a simultaneous sounding board in the New England Journal of, of, of Medicine with the title of Phasing Out Fee-for-Service Payment, which is a major part of what we did. So I'm going to go over the recommendations of the commission uh, sort of briefly. Number one, phase out fee-for-service over time. Why? 
because it's inherently inefficient. That is, it pays you for doing more. And the way the values are structured, it's pro-technology. So if I'm a GI specialist, and I have a patient with uh, ulcerative colitis who's on a flare, I can spend a lot of time talking to that patient, figuring out what his compliance with medications are, what his diet has been, what stress has been, and I'll get a two-figure income. Or I can pass a scope in the same amount of time, do a biopsy, and I'll get a three to four-figure income and, uh, or payment. And uh, both are equally valued. So the incentives are to do more costly things. Number two, um, the transition won't be easy. So start with testing models over a five-year period with the look to, by the end of a decade, most fee-for-service will be gone. Number three, and this, there was some contention on the committee over this one. Um, some of the people, the theoreticians, people who thought, you know, we're writing about this, so it's going to happen, said, don't worry about changing fee-for-service because it's going to be gone. It's going to be the dodo bird. But others of us, and I was one of them, said, uh-uh, it's resilient. It's like Rasputin. You know, you can keep putting daggers in him, but he's going to keep going. So uh, let's fix it while we're changing it, too, um, because we're going to need to keep recalibrating those formulas. For all payers, Medicare and the private health insurers, let's update the annual, up, let's update, um, the annual fee rise for so-called E&M services, um, which are characteristically underpaid. Now, we didn't say E&M services only for primary care. So this was a decision our commission made. We said, we're going to link common cause with endocrinologists, infectious disease specialists, psychiatrists, uh, oncologists, cardiologists, people who have a choice of doing an E&M service or technology. So we're not just going to be special interest pleaders for us. Uh, but let's freeze the updates for these procedure codes unless we can prove that one procedure is undervalued, and I've never seen evidence of any of that. <laughs> then let's do away with this kind of charade that I mentioned. An echocardiogram should cost the same, uh, whether uh, at least if it's, if it's an outpatient echocardiogram, whether it's in a hospital or in a doctor's office. Don't create these incentives to buy up practices and game the system. Also, uh, in the private market, health insurers get lobbied. So a powerful hospital in Boston can get, as I heard yesterday, three times as much money for a C-section as a less powerful hospital in Boston because that uh, group has market share and they'll threaten to pull out of, the, of, out of the private plan. So let's have transparency and let's give similar prices for similar services. These are sort of motherhood and apple pie, six, seven, and eight. One is fee-for-service contracts should include a way to measure quality. And the people have been talking about that for a long time. Uh, measure, saying it is not as easy as doing it, but there has been progress made in trying to measure quality. Then there's a problem with small practices, especially in rural areas. They don't benefit from all the consolidation that you can in a city like this or in a state like ours. Um, so we should let small practices form a relationship that's virtual to give them a chance to harvest some e economies of scale. And then when we move from fee-for-service, let's focus on areas with a high potential for cost and quality savings, and particularly people with high-cost chronic illnesses. Um, there's a risk when you do this that um, healthcare systems will game it by getting easy by sort of cherry picking, picking uh, patients who are not as demographically uh, at risk, patients whose diagnoses are easier. And so let's make sure we can adequate adjust for risk. Let's make sure we're committed to payment. Let's make sure we have quality measures. Do you all know what the SGR is, the sustainable growth rate? You probably heard about this. This is something that was put in by Congress in 1997 to try to rein in Dr. Cost, and then they chickened out. So this was to say a physician, if expending, spending for physicians under Medicare was more than the cost of living increase, then they're going to take it out of the, what they're going to pay the doctors for Medicare the next year. In 2002, 
imaging went through the roof, and so actually Congress cut back doctor payments by 4.8%. They never did that again. So each year, they waive that penalty, and now it's up to something like 25%. And this year, once again, Marshall and I were corresponding. He was saying, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I said, I'm not so sure, Marshall. It didn't happen. They kicked the can down the road. Once again, they said, we're not going to do that penalty. We said, let's get rid of this. It's stupid. And what it does is it penalizes all physicians, and yet it assumes that an individual physician can make any difference. So we said, let's get rid of, of, of SGR. Um, and then the problem is, what do you do with the federal budget? Because um, although healthcare spending has been going down, and this, the uh, foregone revenues at one point were 200 and something billion, they're down to 138, maybe somewhat less now. And where do you get that money from? And um, the Republicans wanted to take it out of welfare programs, and the Democrats didn't. And so that's why you can't get it. Both parties now say SGR is a farce, let's get rid of it but neither one is willing, they can't get a consensus on where they'd recoup that money. And the final recommendation is on the Resource Value Update Committee, which is based right here in Chicago at the AMA. And this is one that sets or recalibrates the prices for new uh, and, and old kind of procedures. And the criticism of it is that it's built like the Senate, not the House. So uh, Wyoming has equal votes with California. People in Wyoming like that, people in California don't. Um, so uh, the plastic surgeons have an equal vote to the family docs. So there are much more uh, representationists coming from um, specialties that do a lot of healthcare procedures, that's one thing. And also the issue is uh, voting isn't transparent. Now, now the collective vote is published, but individual votes aren't. Um, and then finally, we said, let's wean CMS. CMS was adopting like 95% of the recommendations of the work. And we said, let's wean CMS. There are other ways you can get these data. So what was the feedback to our, our commission? Well, when it got set up, our communications people had a press conference and said, this, this, this is going to get set up. I thought it was non-news. But because it's such an inflammatory issue, it, big news, and then all the groups wanted to get a member on it. So the nurses and neurosurgeons, you name them, they all wanted to have a seat on the commission. And we said, send us your input, but it's, it's, it's fixed. We can't give more. Some of the members of our society, although it didn't raise money, it's interesting, Harry and I raised the, raised the money, but they were worried that Senator Friss was going to be a stalking horse for really conservative surgical influences. In fact, Senator Frisch pushed us to do more. So uh, he had, that worry didn't turn out to happen. And then they were worried about lack of uh, basic control over what the recommendations were going to say. And there was a last minute really blow up over that. Turns out they liked it, but they were worried they wouldn't have any control over it. And what our, our answer was, it's going to be more authentic if it represents the broader kind of membership that, that, that that there is. And as I mentioned, we decided not to make it a primary care versus everybody else, but let's balance the scale better, which, uh, which impacts all, all physicians. So we then, when the report came out, uh, our communications people scheduled for myself and for some of the other members of the commission trips to Capitol Hill, both to the House and, House and the Senate, and leaders and even one member of uh, both parties. And basically they said, it's great, it's great. Tell us how to get there. Um, and of course, if you're working f with money from a foundation, you're prohibited by the IRS from writing any, any legislation. Um, and so, but they wanted to get, they also wanted to know with the SGR where, what we thought of about getting the 138 billion. Two days before we went around the hill, the Stephen Brill magazine came out. All of you see this? $1,000 or whatever it was for a Tylenol pill. So the, the outrageous pricing of hospitals for services. And it's interesting, Sherlock Holmes wrote a short story once about the dog that didn't bark, and that was a clue. So there was a dog that hadn't barked on this. Normally, when a negative piece is going to happen, the involved lobby knows in advance and goes on Capitol Hill and tries to kind of modify it. American Hospital Association never showed up on Capitol Hill over this. 
They just didn't do anything about it. They subsequently had a few comments, but not, not much. So we came at a good time because people were worried about pricing. We also went to the major private health payers. And again, they said, looks great. But they, many of them said, well, we're not the leaders here. We're not the top dog. We're going to wait and see what CMS is going to do. And uh, both the AMA and the American College of Physicians said, the ruck isn't really that bad. Uh, we just ought to tweak it a little bit. Uh, most other people didn't, didn't like it. So Marshall asked me to put in a slide an update on the SGR fix. Um, and once again, Congress is working on it. This I wrote that a couple weeks ago. Since then, Congress said, we're not going to do it. We're not going to, uh, we're not going to penalize doctors. So it's what they call kicking the can down the road. Um, people had multiple versions of what the update was going to be. It's, they're liable to be very small in the future because of concerns about budget and about Medicare. Um, and the major roadblock, as I mentioned, is how to get the money. Um, I got connected with a cardiologist friend of our son, David, who's up at Oregon Health Sciences. His name is Eric Strecker, Eric Stecker. And I worked with him on a previous article, which I didn't want my name on. But then he asked me if I would do this. So he took the risk of antagonizing his cardiology colleagues and making the kind of following argument. Um, as we phase out fee-for-service, if that happens, if Rasputin finally dies, um, we're still going to need relative value units. Because if we go to bundled payment, let's say the Mayo Clinic gets $20,000 for bypass surgery. And that includes all the care of everybody, the anesthesiologists, the heart surgeons, the cardiologists, the primary care doctor, the clinical pharmacist. They then have to figure out how to divide that fee. And so the divvying up of the pie is liable to retain the relative value units so central to fee-for-service medicine. Um, and so what uh, Eric did, and then I helped him with it, and he asked me to be a co-author, and he probably did 95% of, of, of the work, is the gist is that the RVUs, relative value units, are liable to stay around. And thus, we need to reform them, because as I pointed out, they're very distorted. And so this is what he proposed, and I've shrunk this from the, from the paper, um, that currently smoking cessation, subject really dear to my heart, which is why it came up first, the current RVUs range from 1 to 3.2, kind of dependent on how much time you spend, 5, 10, or, or, or 15 or more minutes. And he would up that. He would up it from 1 to 3 to 4 to 6. Starting a new evidence-based treatment for congestive heart failure or atrial fibrillation, a similar up. Population management, supervising telephone-based care management of congestive heart failure or coronary artery disease, which would be a big part of a capitated system, currently gets no RVU dollars. And he would propose that you'd get 20 for every 50 patients, so making it more worth, worth their while. Then he got into, he started goring the cardiologist ox. So an ST elevated a, 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 acute MI having a stent. So these are all what, how much you pay for stents. Um, if you do it. Uh, ST, ST elevated uh, acute MI, unspecified, 12.6 units either way. If the door, getting in the door of the ER to the balloon uh, is less than 60 minutes, he would double it. But if um, the, um, afford, is the uh, authorized usual care score, this is a cardiology committee, I've forgotten what the acronym is, but these are authorizations of, if it's seven to nine in this clinical condition, it is really worth doing. If it's four to six, it's equivocal. If it's one to three, the evidence is that you shouldn't do it. So he was saying, if you have chronic stable angina and the score is seven to nine, and you do the stent in an approved lab, he'd go from the current 11.2 to 14. If you do it in equivocal circumstances in an approved lab, you cut it in half. And if you did it with a low score in an unapproved lab, you go down to 2.8. The idea here is you'd still get paid. You'd get paid a lot less. So you're taking away the incentive for doing a marginal kind of a, a, kind of a procedure. Same thing with an implantable cardiac defibrillator. You can see that the higher score in an approved lab goes from 15.2 to 19, that the medium score with an approved lab cut in half 
and you can see that it's cut in a quarter if it's, uh, if it's a, a, a not a very good uh, in indication and uh, it doesn't have an approved lab. So um, that, was where, that was this paper and it came out in December of 2013. And to Eric's kind of surprise and pleasure, he didn't get beat up by his fellow cardiologists. They said, makes sense. Um, this shows you that even in the last 17 years or so, there's been very little rise in what primary care doctors make, a big rise in dermatology. The effort hasn't changed. So why the increase? Well, uh, I got quoted in a New York Times article saying that it makes no sense. I was, sort of, I was paraphrasing George Bernard Shaw, but when I, I have a lot of uh, sun damage, it's probably genetic and it's also growing up in, in California. So I have a primary care dermatologist. He's really good and he'll put liquid nitrogen on a bunch of things, occasionally do a, a biopsy, takes 15 minutes, bills $650. Uh, and that's typical. And I commented on that and I got a letter, in, so I was quoted on that in, in an article by Elizabeth Ro Rosenthal. And I got a letter from a derm person saying, uh, this isn't fair. And I said, well, you know, that, that's what happens. He said, it doesn't happen un under Medicare. I said, but it does under private health insurance. So this just shows you the difference. I won't read them all, but you can see. And the amount of hours worked is relatively comparable across those specialties. Now, I'm not arguing they ought to be flat. You know, I think a cardiac surgeon or a neurosurgeon really deserves their skill and there's, uh, there's uh, extra training and they should get more. But uh, most other countries don't have this. And this difference is a direct function of the way we pay under fee for service. So United Health Group, uh, which is I think the second or, la or third largest uh, health insurance company, is in a transition here. And they've scaled this out. They let me use this, this graph. And this is the wave of the future. This is the degree of integration of doctors. So this is a solo practice. This is Kaiser. Uh, and this is level of risk. And we're on our way here, and different parts of the system are there, and different groups are there, um, but it's gonna happen. The question is how quickly and where and when. And the idea is that they're gonna try to put medical groups at risk for outcomes, uh, and, and base payment on outcomes too, and there will not be incentives to keep doing more. Okay, so I did a long riff on fee-for-service. And now we're back to the question, the Schroeder synthesis of why does the United States, the United States spend so much more on healthcare? Um, practice style variations. Yeah, um, people get a lot more stuff in Florida than in the Twin Cities or in North Dakota. So there are big, and we, even within a certain state, there are real variations. And the Dartmouth group has been major at showing this. Um, it, Administrative costs. So if you're at the Toronto General, which is a thousand bed hospital, you go to the billing office in the basement, you got a grizzled guy in a lumberjack shirt who's sending, who's sending bills to the province who will pay as asked. You go to the Mass General, same size, you got guys in striped suits, tassel loafers, consulting algorithms, sending bills to 500 different health insurance premium uh, companies uh, and trying to figure out how to get the best payment. Health insurance companies in the United States are figuring out how to delay your payment, how to pay you less. So a tremendous amount of the health care of the hospital dollar in the United States goes to managing health insurance bills. It's just empty calories. Malpractice. Talk to doctors. That's the number one thing. You know, I order all these tests because I'm afraid of getting sued. Well, the IOM and others have studied this, and they estimated a couple years ago that, yeah, we spend about an unnecessary $54 billion a year. That's not chump change, but on a denominator of 2.7 trillion, it is chump change. And so if we fix malpractice totally, we'd be down from 17.9% to what, 17% or something like that. So much, much, you know, it doesn't make much of a difference. Aging population, everybody knows that as we get older, people are more liable to get healthcare because they get sicker and they get stuff done. Um, and so that's a reason why we stand out. Well, in fact, because we have so many immigrants, our country is one of the youngest of the Western countries. 
So Japan, very, very old population. They're not bringing in immigrants. The Scandinavian countries, so we're actually relatively younger. Patient demand, absolutely. Uh, I had a sabbatical in London where we studied healthcare systems. And I had been reading the San Francisco Chronicle, um, which is a rag. I mean, it's just, it's just a bad paper. But they, almost every day, they'd have a front page story on some new breakthrough. And then when the breakthrough didn't happen, of course, it wouldn't show up. Uh, the London Times, which was a premier journal, a premier paper, didn't do that. Uh, and the patients in England and elsewhere in Europe just had less expectations. I'm going to show a, a slide about that. So that's a big push. Um, the economists say the reason we're there or a way to, to get us better is to have us be as competitive on cost as possible. Now, Europe doesn't compete on cost. So we didn't get there by lack of competition. But it may be one of the answers to bending the cost curve. We don't know yet. Low investment in IT. So now in England, every physician has an electronic medical record. Um, and England spends, or the UK spends, about 7% of its GDP on healthcare. And people who don't know say, well, that's the reason. Well, they know. They only put the EHR, electronic medical record, in two or three years ago. So they grafted that on to a low GDP. It might be that if we went to, a, to a, and if, as we keep going to an EHR, we might generate some cost savings. So far, those haven't happened, even though we had tremendous federal incentives to, uh, to spread the EHR. Fraud and abuse is a big issue here. We don't know how much of it is an issue over there, uh, but um, clearly um, we need to. And there's this story today in the New York Times, which is very crude. I refuse to answer what the, you know, the, the journalist wanted me to comment on it. I just gave her two, a, a one sentence. I said, it's good for transparency, but it would open the doors to mischief. So for example, if there's one person billing on behalf of a whole group in an indigent clinic, it's going to make it look like that person is, is a robber. But this issue for more transparency is, is going to happen. And maybe it'll caution some folks. So unnecessary care. The wise people at the IOM did this study, probably a $2 million study. We could have done it cheaper. Um, and you can see how they parsed out that about one third of our health care based on 2009 dollars could have been vanished without any impact on quality. That's a big chunk. That would take us from 18% of GDP down to 12%. Getting there isn't easy. People worry about rationing in the United States and in Canada. And this is an interesting study showing uh, uh, coronary artery uh, bypass, excuse me, uh, angioplasty bypass and surgery on the carotid for the young old and the old old. And where we really stand out compared to Canada is in the old old. We do about eight times as much on those. I don't know what the right number is, but you hear anecdotes of people with profound de dementia getting this kind of stuff, which to my view is probably wasted. So when we were living in England, it was supported by the, the Commonwealth Fund, and we did a study of elderly English-speaking people. And we asked this question, which turned out to be a brilliant question. I didn't think of it. One of my colleagues did. If your personal doctor told you that you had incurable and fatal disease, would you accept that diagnosis or seek a second o opinion? And you got to love the Brits, right? It's, well, love, it's been a good year. It's been a good life. Let's have a cup of tea and prepare our will. <laughs> and this must be Idaho or Wyoming or so. I don't know where those people are. Uh, so. By world standards, I mean, if you look at cosmetic surgery or ultra complementary and alternative treatment, whatever, we just do so much more of that because people in this country aren't prepared to die. Maybe that's good, but it's just a fact. And that clearly is a driver, getting people to do more. And expenditures are asymmetric. You can really see here that uh, the top 1% consumes about a quarter of all spending, the top 5%, 50%. So management of these cases can clearly be helpful. So when I was in England, being a professor of medicine in the United States is no big deal. Being a professor of medicine overseas is a big deal. There are only two or three per academic department. So I would write from my base at St. Thomas's to teaching hospitals in Germany, France, uh, Belgium, Holland, um, 
I'm coming over. I'd love to see your system. Uh, can you take me on around and meet with me? So I'd be greeted by all the leadership. What does a professor at UC in the United States look like? So they take me on rounds, and the rounds, the beds on the regular wards look just like here at UCSF or Yale. And I'd say, take me to your ICU. Boy, was that different. This was in 1983. But boy, was that different. First of all, great big hospitals, ICU, 10 beds. The train wrecks weren't there. People weren't intubated. They weren't comatose. They, didn't, they weren't getting dialyzed. So I would say to my host, where are the train wrecks? And they usually spoke English. And there'd be this long silence. They'd look down at their shoes. And finally, one of them would say, Dr. Schroeder, we trained at your, we trained at a hospital. We did a fellowship at Penn or whatever. God, we loved it there. The, you know, the technology is so good. Your teaching is so wonderful. Pause. But you don't know when to stop. And so I constructed this cartoon of pressures. Um, the US is in red and Europe is in blue. From the patient and the family, referring to the general's physician, to the specialist, to the community hospital, to the ICU at the community hospital, to places like here, to the ICU here, we have pressures going much more towards more than um, they had in, in Europe. And it's that constellation, I think, that adds to cost. So why can't we curb costs in the United States? Well, this is, again, a Schroeder synthesis. Um, we don't like limiting choices. People from overseas are blown away by our grocery stores. How many different kinds of milk is there? are there? How many different kinds of ice cream, bread? We just have, we love choices. Power of the industries uh, and the fact that our, our system of politics is so fueled by uh, contributions. Power of the medical and hospital sectors and academic medicine, I might say, which does extremely well but is always crying that it's bleeding to death. New technologies which are priced high. The fact that our political system can't deal with these kinds of issues. It can't deal with global climate change either. We just don't do well with issues of, 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 of controversy. So why not let the cost keep rising? Some people have said, boy, if you're sick or your family's sick, what better could you be than to get all the best possible medical care for them? And the answer is the opportunity cost. So if you haven't noticed, our schools aren't doing very well. And they come from the same public dollar that healthcare does. Um, global climate change, I think, is a huge issue. It's hard to be as competitive with other countries if we're spending for our products so much on health care for our workers. And you might think of other worthy causes. Um, business is pushing back now, pushing more and more of the health care costs onto its workers, saying we don't want to bear them, uh, cutting off previously covered benefits for people who used to work there, biggest single source of labor disputes, biggest single cause of personal bankruptcies, and of course, pressure on public hospitals like your county hospital here. And then increasingly, there's a consensus in Washington that we can't let costs, which are so, which are so often funded by uh, a public sector, we can't let them keep rising. And of course, mean higher, higher premiums mean more uninsured, as people can't afford to give them. So I think I got this all in headline on the final bullet. This will be the defining health policy issue for the next three decades, maybe more. And as I mentioned, we have a system that's really in flux. So it's a wonderful opportunity to study what's going on now. I mentioned the buying of hospital practices. The insurers and employers are shifting costs to their patients. There's more of an attempt to pay for value. And I get, at UCSF at least, tremendous professional interest in reducing unnecessary medical care. So here's some examples of that. You heard of the Choosing Wisely campaign? American Board of in, in Internal Medicine has asked each specialty to pick five procedures or things that it thinks are overdone. And mostly it's been plain vanilla. But occasionally some of them are done, like uh, SGIM said annual physical isn't needed, which cuts off the income of SGIM members, which is why it's an academic group, not a, not a practicing group, I guess. Rita Redberg at UCSF, who's a cardiologist, has How many of you read JAMA Medicine? She has transformed what used to be the archives into, and she calls it less is more, and has periodic features on examples where doing more was bad. And Alan Schroeder, our pediatric son, has coined a group of studies called Safely Doing Less, where he has found clinical procedures where if you do less, 
the kid actually do, does better. Like uh, studying little girls with UTIs, you don't need to do a vesicular urogram. Showed that you didn't need to do that. And it caused discomfort and it caused trauma. So are we in the, have we f fixed this? Medical expenditures have been stable the past three years. In part it's because the economy has been, it's gone up, in other words, it's gone up at the same rate as the cost of, of living, which isn't much. A lot of people think it's because with so many people out of work or worried about being out of work, they spend less, they don't do the d discretionary things that call it, that are, you have to do a cost pay or a cost share on. Um, but part may be that the pressure's coming down from purchasers and patients. Some people think that the ACA may have stimulated this, and we don't really know. You'll read a lot about it, but we don't really know yet. So some WAG once said, our healthcare priorities are this. We want the best. We want it right now. We want choices. We want someone else to pay for it. If we can't get it, we'll sue. <laughs> Most countries pick two or three of those. We picked all five. Hard to get a coherent policy out of that. So here's my final slide. I give similar talks like this at UCSF. And last year, one of the students said, what would you recommend? I felt it was fair to put it on, so this year I put it on. So I would recommend, just as our SJM Commission paper said, phase out fee-for-service payment to physicians, but also recalibrate it prior to its being phased out. Palliative care and care at the end of life services, to get that 1% that's getting 27% of all the spending. Um, most people don't want to die in, in, in the ICU. And palliative care actually got its start by Chris Castle, who was here, this is the head of the general medicine section. Now there's a section at Mount Sinai that actually Robert Johnson helped to start, Diane Myers on it. It's a win-win. People want it and it's, it saves money. And hospitals are beginning, now there's, uh, thanks in part to her center, most academic centers have a palliative care center. You have one here, I'm sure, right? And is, is it a good one? Good, okay. You, you, you wouldn't say no. Regarding new technologies, require evidence that they work in comparison to the one they're choosing. So it's easy to get imaging technologies that give clearer resolution. And often the clearer resolution is 5 or 10% and the increased cost is 5x. And so require before they're paid for that they make a meaningful difference and then set the price reasonably. Case management for the, for the hot zones, for the high flyers, for those people who keep coming in and out of the hospital. Often, if you get someone, a low cost person, to just manage to make sure they take their meds, you can prevent hospitalization, which again is a win-win. And nobody likes to go in the hospital, so it's better quality of care and it's lower cost. And then finally, the students like this one. Um, students are graduating owing a, a couple hundred thousand dollars and often marry classmates. If they're having that kind of debt, which Europe doesn't, Europe basically gives medical student education for free. We're making students take this burden on. They're not gonna feel very good about charity care, and they're not gonna feel very good about getting off the road to, to uh, a, a, a happy specialty. So um, that's the end of this talk. I think there's time, Marshall, for a question and answer. And again, it's a pleasure to be here with you in Chicago. <laughs> One of your year to end slides, uh, you, you referred to the ACA as accelerating the discussion of, of these many issues on finance reform. What's your opinion? Uh, will it accelerate or hinder uh, the movement in the way that you like? You have oh, I got my mic. So, uh, there are provisions to stimulate accountable care organizations, primary care medical homes, pilot demonstrations. All those, in theory, can uh, save money. The demonstrations to date have not been terribly promising. The results have not been terribly promising. Uh, I think the fact that there is flux and that insurers are worried about new people coming onto the market and the fact that um, part of the ACA included finding a trillion dollars in savings to pay for the expanded coverage has sensitized people to this. So I don't know, the jury is still out. And of course, the um, implementation of the ACA has fallen so far short because of the Medicaid ruling and also that many states don't want to do it. 
So, I mean, one of this is a separate issue, but one of the tragedies is there's only about 10 million now who were insured. We thought there'd be as many as 32 million. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent talk. That You're welcome. Super. Um, just recently, the Illinois State Bar Association had a uh, seminar on reimbursement. The consensus among all the individuals that spoke said that in five years, it'll be consumer-directed health care, that the consumer will be given more wherewithal to direct their own health care with, with the idea that we educate them so they'd understand what kind of health care to get. And I'd like to hear your comments on that. Well, I think the social media and all the things that we know about the Twitter and the, and the, fa and the Facebook and all that means that people are much more knowledgeable and are much more able to uh, understand choices and to ask for them. The problem is that it's the epidemiology is asymmetric. So the folks at Stanford know that their business school graduates are really good at this, but they're not sick. And the 1% that's consuming the 27% tend to be older. They may not be as literate on computers. They may be from lower uh, SES status. They may not speak English as a prime language. So I'm not as bullish on that five-year estimate. I think it's going to happen, but I think it's going to take a lot longer. <clears throat> Thank you. Excellent presentation. Uh, but the reality is that if your commission's uh, recommendations ever become a reality, they have to be filtered through the lens of the difficult uh, trek through interspace politics. What's the, what's the position of the AMA um, and the Hot American Hospital Association on your <coughs> initial recommendations you presented? They didn't take, they didn't say no, they didn't say yes. They, we asked them to sign off on it, they didn't do that, but they didn't say no. A number of different groups did sign off on it, but not as many as, as we would have liked. And uh, change is hard, as, as you all know. When you're talking about European countries, you're talking about the differences in medical care. How can it is Okay. So single payer is different from how doctors get paid. Single payer is just where the bank is. Um, and so each of those countries then has to figure out how to pay their doctors. What it does do is it gives you the capacity. So I'm in general a big single payer fan, but with a couple of caveats. Um, uh, it does give you the capacity to centralize things. Um, it gives you much more of a, of a, of a capacity to cut back on, on, on spending and to, to calibrate the, the uh, rates. But how about female reproductive services under single payer? What do you think would happen under President Cruz? <laughs> well, are you sure you'd want to go that route? So uh, we're not Canada. Canada is a parliamentary forum where um, if the party in power wants to do something, it happens. In the United States, uh, any group can sort of cancel out stuff. So I'm probably a little less, e e little in this country of 340 million people with a political system that's basically broken, that is driven by financing, I'm not as enthusiastic about government control as I was a decade ago. Right. They have a kind of a form of single so what, what Germany has is it has a fail-safe government program, but most people go into through their bunds, they go into private health insurance plans, but there's a, there's a safety net. Um, and those plans figure out how they pay. So the paying of doctors is somewhat uncoupled from who pays, but for reasons I don't fully comprehend, part of it actually, I'll tell you, when um, Wilbur, Wilbur Cohen came to UCSF in the 70s, and I asked him, why did Medicare incorporate this usual customer and reasonable charge for paying doctors, which is so inflationary and so pro-technology? And he said, Steve, I made a mistake. I thought I could buy out the AMA. I gave them what they wanted, and they still argued against. Uh, and he said, if I had to do it again, I wouldn't do it. Now, whether it would have gone through or not, I don't know. So they're peculiar. This is a very different country. Um, I was uh, speaking up in Canada just after the Clinton health plan failed, and they won the water failed, and I had to tell them, and it, the Canadians just didn't get this, that the United States fundamentally, going way, way back, doesn't trust government. And the Canadians, because the Canadians do trust government. So we have a very different system. Our constitution was set up differently. It works mainly, it doesn't always work. Uh, 
thanks for thanks for speaking. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about how um, you know increasing uh, the amount of quality metrics that people can view um, might might change things. What do you think is most important about that in terms of helping um, payers or consumers down the road start to make the right decisions? Uh, what, how does that information need to be shared, and what should be shared? It's a very important and complicated question. I'm not sure I can answer it fully. I'm not sure I have the expertise to, but let me, let me try to. Um, it's really easy to say, let's pay more for quality and less for not quality. Um, that then means you've got to look at evidence. And um, when I was practicing um, and there were guidelines that came out, I would often find to the, to the frustration I had that the circumstances of my patient didn't fit in those guidelines. So I think the execution of paying for quality it's not going to be as easy. They usually start with cardiac procedures, and the one that Eric Stecker showed on that, and, and you, you could do that. So if the criteria are one through three, then you just don't pay much for a stent in those circumstances or a de defibrillator. But um, there's so many varieties of how to pay, and look at Alzheimer care. What's quality in Alzheimer care? So the measurement, it's wonderful for, for, for health services researchers because it's a way to keep studying and doing that. Um, I think the premise that you've got to justify what you're doing is going to be good, is reasonable. Um, it gets tricky. So, when you're in, so if you're an oncologist, you've got a patient with stage four cancer, and you're showing and you failed two, two chemotherapies, there's some people who say you shouldn't offer a further chemotherapy. And others who say, well, you should do it, but with the full knowledge that what the suffering is going to be. And what there often is is asymmetric disclosure of information. So for example, on prostate surgery, the literature before they began studying it was that the rate of complications of incontinence and impotence were really low. Well, when some internists started saying, they thought, wow, it's a lot higher than the GU people said, said they were. So part of it is getting information, which I fully support. Part of it is sort of transparency. Part of it is transparency of costs. Uh, in this way, and it's interesting, the US leads the world. We're doing more research on this stuff than other places do. Um, but people who tell you it's going to be easy tend to be theorists who are not getting, are not in, in the trenches. And it's much harder to work, out, at least in the way I think. Mark I'd be curious, you're, you're closer to this than I am. What do you think of uh, the ease of using quality to drive patient payment? Well, I think it's, it's challenging for the reasons you said, but I think you do have to link quality metrics as well as financial incentives to have all the alignment right for you have the maximum chance of real world success. I agree in theory. Is it, how hard is it to do it? <laughs> Challenging. <laughs> a, a bit related to the last question is looking at the, the five sort of recommended strategies at the, at, the end, at the end, I was struck by the third part about sort of Can um, we go back? the payment for technology and sort of being more critical around that. Yep. Being something that seems so much further out in the future. Uh, could you lay over sort of a time and optimism component to some of these? Like, are, do you see any of these as sort of just legitimate, much closer, quick wins, and, and others that are that maybe don't meet the ten-year time horizon and you know, don't know how we're going to get there, but it's still preferred. So this is on very specific diagnosis and, and, and treatment technologies? How much hype is, is there? Is that your question? Yeah, I guess with specific interest on that one, but then also if there are others that um, you think are either further out. Okay. So you've got that, remember that chain I showed where all the forces are to do more? And that really fuels innovation and the drive to do stuff. And you know, you've got cancer and you want to beat it. And so there's a tremendous amount of stuff coming out. And we have a system perfectly, so somebody once said, when you see a turtle on a fence post, it didn't get there by itself. And we have a system perfectly designed to be where it is. We have high consumer expectations. We have a, a real propensity to sue. We have physicians whose incomes are really dependent. So an, an oncologist gets much, much, much more money from using chemotherapy from, from not doing chemotherapy. So the best meeting oncologist, if the situation is equivocal and there's a new drug out and he's going to get a lot more money for it, the incentive, the person's human, is to want to say, you know, let's try this. So uh, imaging, oncology, all these, they keep coming out. Um, and, um, we're, and also, that's what the papers, that's what the journals publish. 
So I'm amazed. I'll read articles in the, in, in the New England Journal. I was, on, I was on its editorial board for a long time. They publish articles on can, a new cancer drug that extends life for two months. And that's a big deal. And maybe it is a big deal. I, mean, I don't have cancer now. So maybe it would be a big deal for me. And the costs are $100,000 annually. So who's going to pay for that? So we're going to get into ethics at some point. Um, someone asked me, getting back to the kind of single payer issue, what would it take to get everybody covered by, by national health insurance? And I would say it's an economic, it's a, it's a catastrophe that, you know, that we get a great depression, not a recession, and people lose their jobs and their health insurance, and that would spark it. Uh, thanks for your talk today. What do you believe is the most productive way that physicians can become involved in uh, policy change or begin to affect it, okay. other than simply voting for their preferred official? In what way can they, as physicians, and this is a okay. general physicians, not just people picked for communities, um, contribute to health care overhaul? So that's a great question. What can individual physicians do? And I get that. UCSF has a lot of very socially conscious students and residents, and they come to me all the time. Part of me, and I've sent some to work in Washington, I have to tell you, part of me worries because the climate in Washington is so poisonous now that I worry that an immersion in that climate is going to turn them off. But they don't seem to be. They're young and optimistic, and they're going to change things. Um, you can do it on a number of different levels. You can do, as Mark is trying to do here with his center, you can create a model in your own place. But then you've got to make sure that the rest of the world knows about it. You can get active in politics. You can get active on the issues. You can work for non-governmental or, or organizations. You can write. You can help your local newspaper cover this better. Um, you, there are just a whole lot of different things. Um, what faculty can do is there's the Robert Johnson Health Policy Fellowship Program, where you can actually go to work on the Hill, often in the Senate, to actually see how bills get made. Uh, there's a former health policy, why don't you stand up? There's a former health policy fellow in the audience who worked for Senator Kennedy. W was it a good year? Great year. Um, so you can do that. You have to be nominated by your school. Um, you can get jobs on the Hill. Um, and I've gotten UCSF medical students jobs at the Institute of Medicine to work on projects. So they, they can do it. Um, you can work on the issues. You can make it your scholarly uh, uh, career, as Marshall's done. There are lots of really different ways. One thing to do it is find someone who you think is a role model and talk to them. If you send me your email, I give a talk on alternate careers in healthcare. I'd be glad to send you my, my slide deck. Schroeder at medicine.ucsf.edu. You've had your hand up a long time, you're in vision. That's okay. Um, Dr. Shorter, I'm going to go back to when you were talking about innovation and your definition of it, because technology is an innovation, but there are low-tech innovations that, has there ever been a comparison looking at the ROI on something, for example, like a culinary clinic or the medication checks you mentioned in terms of the return on those labor-intensive steps and then the advancement to getting better outcomes compared to the newest breakthrough technology. I walk that divide between breakthrough technologies, but then I do 12 hours doing just basic education and nutrition, and I can see there's a better ROI. The second question goes So let me answer that one first before I forget it, and then you, you keep the microphone. So who funds studies of ROIs? It's government and it's industry. They want something new and dazzling. Um, using a thiazide for hypertension instead of a third generation whatever is much cheaper. No pharmacy company is going to fund that. So it's very hard to get money to study low technology ROI. It, um, the, the Kaisers of the world could do that, but it doesn't. So um, the incentives on, as I watch faculty, is to do the dazzling new thing, the new buzzword, the new technology for which you can get money. And even our, even our government programs tend not to do that. They like to do, now the big thing is the, the social media. Uh, a home visit, it's very low tech, ROI in selected categories, no one's gonna fund that. Or it'll be hard to get it funded. Your second question. 
will find it. It's, it would be probably one with a lot of hits. I think that it would overturn yeah. some of the comments that come out of rain. Second question goes to Dartmouth and their ANOVA and their comments coming out about innovation in primary care. What can you tell us that you think is really something that's exciting out of that group? Out of Dartmouth? In the ANOVA clinic where they take yeah. the innovations, they bring it to a consensus on which one they're kind of almost as stakeholders going to invest in and then roll it out and have it across the board. So you know more about it than I do. I can't tell you much. I know Tom Bodenheimer at UCSF, who was a resident with me, has been talking about redesign of primary care. He's written a lot on that. Um, it's harder to do in smaller practices. It's easier to do in the Kaisers of the world. It's easier to do when you get fiscal incentives to save money for not hospitalizing people. People have asked me today in earlier meetings, is there a future to, um, to being a primary care physician? I think that there definitely is, but um, it's going to require being creative, using other health personnel, those sorts of things. Question. That's all right. Um, what role do you believe physicians should have in grassroots uh, political advocacy for health care change? Okay. Uh, for example, there's an on-campus student group called the Students for Health Equity, pushing for an adult level one trauma center to be reestablished at the center that a number of doctors have openly come out in support of and have, in fact, attended protests themselves. Do you believe that physicians should be involved in that kind of advocacy, or they should m mostly stay in the back room, you know, research-based dealings? I don't think it has to be either or, as I think they can be advocates and others. One of the issues challenging medicine as advocates is that there is no single organization who really speaks for them. The membership of the AMA is about 22% now of, of all practicing doctors, a little higher if you add residents. Um, so most doctors link in with their specialist society. And whether it's the cardiologist or the neurosurgeons, the radiologist, when they go to Washington, they, they lobby for two things. Don't cut our fees or please raise our fees and help us with mal, malpractice suits. Um, AMSA, American Medical Student Association, is probably the most progressive of any medical stuff, but they're gone, so the leadership keeps turning over. Um, I think if I were to lobby as medical students, I would look at the healthcare tuition. And I think, I don't think it costs as much to educate a medical student as they say it does. Uh, and I think uh, tuitions are helping to subsidize research and faculty. And, but students can't organize because A, they're gone quickly, and B, uh, they're worried about you know, being the squeaky wheel or the nail that sticks up is going to get hammered down. So I, there is room for advocacy, um, but it doesn't, structurally, it's really challenging now. Um, in the smoking world where I'm in, one of the reasons why smoking rates in the United States are down so low is advocacy from doctors. The rate of physician smoking is 1%. Portugal is 40%. China, for the male doctors, is 50%. So one reason we've gotten so much kind of support, one reason why conservative governors are willing to raise the price on a tax, uh, the, the tax on a pack of cigarettes uh, is that the doctors and the groups like the American Cancer Society and the Lung Association, Heart Association, go and they say, this is the right thing you should do. So doctors can be very powerful in public health ad, uh, advocacy. They're also fractured because if you poll them, they don't, you know, some single payer, some, you know, it's all over the map. So it's harder to get a consensus, and it's hard to speak with, with one voice. So it's more like a tower, a tower of Babel. Thank you so much for the talk. It was really um, enjoyable. Um, my question would be, do you see, what kind of ways do you see that um, the consumer demand could be tempered and the expectations could be lowered in the society. So whether there would be any financial incentives or disincentives that your bullet number two of palliative care would become more of a standard thinking in society versus number five or six course of chemotherapy or number five or six month in the ICU after LFS. That's a great question. The question if you didn't hear it is, how can we alter consumer demand? And I think it gets back to the question, who, is, who asked the question about uh, uh, innovation and all that? So I think it is gonna happen. 
Um, and I think one of the things is education. There's asymmetric in, in information now. And um, where is palliative care taking off? It's taking off in the educated people. And one of the sad things is that people of color are so suspicious of the healthcare system that they think that not doing everything is white man's attempt to uh, cut back on what, they're, what they should get. Um, but just as smoking and fitness and statins start in the upper classes and they kind of trickle into lower, I think palliative care, uh, and I think knowing uh, and being, the other th thing that's a problem is being literate in numbers. So uh, what does a 1% chance of cure mean? What does a 10% chance of in incontinence mean? But I think um, having access to real good data on what the risks and the benefits are. And increasingly, I think people are saying, I don't want to do that. Uh, I don't want to have that. I know you've had speakers here who have made the choice not to seek a, a, a full core press. I'm actually a little more bullish on that as a strategy, but it's, it's going to take a very long time. And it feeds against all the forces that I showed on that previous slide. So next week, our speaker is Mike Ketting, who used to work at the administration here at University of Chicago. And he's currently the Deputy Director for Planning and Reform Implementation at the Illinois Department of Health Care and Family Services. And he's going to be talking about challenges of implementing the ACA here in Illinois. Well, let's thank Dr. Schroeder for a very thoughtful <laughs>